Excite us with this certain hope that you have given all who believe. Entice those who don't yet have this hope for themselves into your family by faith. We worship and thank you. Amen. Although we've been married for over 10 years, I'm happy to say I often catch my wife looking at, at her. Oh! Cooking too much. There we go. Did you miss the beginning? I'm so loud. It's so tricky, isn't it? But I do, I do, uh, I do still today, from time to time, catch Megan looking at the diamond ring on her finger. The diamond ring, which I could never afford because it belonged to her grandmother. Her diamond ring that she likes to look from different angles, and I'll just catch her doing this sometimes. It's absolutely fantastic, isn't it? A diamond so beautiful. I learned today that a diamond can have as many as 70 facets. Isn't that beautiful and complex? And we like to see light shining through each one of those, especially when you take it to be evaluated and you know how much it costs, which I'm not telling you. But I'm telling you this, I'm glad I live not in Brazil. Just as we like looking at the different facets of a diamond, so it has been when we look at the book of Revelation and its description of our heavenly existence with God. Chapter 19, the facet of a bride. So beautiful. A picture of intimacy with God. And then we look at chapter 21 and the image of the community of people that belong to God described as precious and beautiful as a city. The New Jerusalem, a description of the people of God. And then we come to chapter 22, and we see if we can finish it this evening, where it's entitled on your NIV Bibles, Eden Restored, because there's a picture of the curse seen in the book of Genesis, undone. So let's look at this renewed Eden, this garden that shows the curse undone this evening. Uh, young people, you tell me if you now pass this test. Tell me the curse. Wingardium Leviosa. What does it do? Well, there you go. There's even those of us who are a little bit older. <laughs> we'll know this. Oh, sorry. I better watch myself. Um, you know, Avada Kedavra. That's the, see, Harry Potter, Harry Potter books. Yeah, that's the one you die. The Crucio. Exactly. See, I love this, this one person that's just doing the action so perfectly. It's so good. Amazing. So many people around us and so many people in my school's work and children's work know the exact meaning of each of those curses, but could not tell me what has happened when the Lord cursed humanity. It, it, when they come to think of it, what does it mean? What has actually happened? Obviously, the Harry Potter curses are just fictional. But here, do we know the implications of this curse, which, if we don't know the implications of it, we read Revelation 22 and we miss exactly the beauty of what it is that it's being undone here. For example, let's say that you were in Genesis chapter 3 now, and you read verse 14. You would read, curse are you above all livestock. And then you read, there is enmity between the snake and in the woman. And you know with a little bit more gospel knowledge later that Satan tries to destroy any hope of humanity being rescued. If you were to read on a little bit in Genesis 3:17, cursed is the ground because of you. And we hear of the frustration, the futility of work. That's why it's not just teenagers that don't want to do work sometimes. I don't either. And sometimes we feel the frustration of it, and we don't get a lot of bang for our buck that we put in. And then in Genesis 3.16, that your desire will be for your husband, he will rule over you. A loss of the God-designed roles for marriage, not a joy in how he's designed things. I wonder if anything else comes to mind when you think about the curse in Genesis. You see, John is going to take us through how what has been spoiled at Eden is made new 
and it's joyful for us here. So the curse undone in God's place. A beautiful description here. Look at it in verse 3. Here's the picture. No longer will there be any curse. I mean, I think that's part of the drumbeat of this chapter. That's quite beautiful. Uh, Right up there with the no in verse 5. No more night. Because it seems if we're digging into Revelation and it's symbolic and beautiful, well then, God shining on people because it always speaks of God's favor. No more night here therefore means there's no darkness, there's no spiritual darkness because all of us will know and enjoy the presence of God forever. That's why you should be brought right back to places like Numbers chapter 6, for example, where we have here, help me out, brother, there we go, the Lord bless you and keep you, the ironic uh, blessing on the people of God. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. This idea that if the Lord's face shines on you, blessing, peace, security are with you. And therefore, I would look at this, no more night speaks of no more darkness separating us from the enjoyment of God forever. There's not a single thought that threatens our joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Until then, we are tempted to put our longing for heaven in, I don't know, relationships or in entertainment or in the security uh, of money or in the security of academic knowledge. But we keep on finding that until we get to this place where the Lord's face so shines upon us, there is no more darkness. Every time we get frustrated, it's an opportunity for us to go, I long for this day. I long for this day. When there will be no more darkness in me or around me. But look at the rest of it. Verse 1, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Uh, Those of you who like astronomy, uh, what is it that astronomers tend to get very excited about if they see hints of it on other planets? Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Such an essential thing about life without which there can be no life, water, we have this beautiful picture here that the water of life never runs out in this place. If you like, say, the book of Ezekiel, you would have found that this is an echo of Ezekiel chapter 47, where uh, Ezekiel gives us a picture of the temple of God, and right from under it flows a river. But here John says, hey, I've told you already That this city is the people of God. There's no temple because God lives in his people. And so now, this crystal clear river of eternal life flows and irrigates the city. And I think what's interesting, and you can be the judge of this, um, the river being crystal clear, crystal clear, nothing wrong, nothing to pollute it which I think is a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, his spiritual promise of life. If he says, trust in me, I give you life, it's certain. Every other religion, when it wants to take a a, a bite of Jesus and say, we also believe in Jesus, but he is a prophet, they pollute the eternal life that Jesus offers. They sway you away from looking at him and enjoying him. Do you remember that conversation uh, with the Samaritan woman where Jesus says to her, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, he says, believing in him is enough for our salvation, for our place in God's family. And then he adds this in that same conversation, that the Father invites us to believe in him in spirit and in truth. So that when any other religion mixes Jesus and something else, they take you to a polluted water that does not give life. Uh, They sway you from the Lord Jesus who alone can can give us life. So that you end up in a place, like the prophet Jeremiah says, 
with cisterns that don't hold water. That was my very conversation with a group of year sixes earlier uh, this week um, at, at a school near here. Because after I did my presentation, they had a question and answer time. And one of the questions was, how can you know that this is true? How can you know that this is true? How do you know that God exists? How do you know that the Bible is trustworthy? How do you know you're not wrong in your religion? Which I thought, that's pretty good for your sixes in a primary school, isn't it? And yet, I can speak to what Jesus is saying, that if you are to believe in spirit and in truth, you believe because the Spirit of God has opened your eyes to see, and therefore you believe the truth about Jesus, you believe everything Jesus says, and I told them, I believe because the more I encounter the Scriptures, I read it, they have the ring of truth to them. And then secondly, they explain exactly why I am the way I am, who I am, why the world is the way it is, better than any other alternative, any other religion, and no religion. Pretty amazing. So the river or the water of life is there. There is life forever in the Lord Jesus. And here's the other picture in verse 2. Down the middle of the great street, the river flows. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, I find it fascinating that in many other places uh, in the New Testament, when it speaks of the cross of Christ, did you know it's the same word for tree? You know, I think that's pretty curious. This word zilon, in a verse like this, he himself, uh, 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. In his body on the cross, in his body on the tree. How curious that the NIV is in a minority on this. The ESV, the NET, all translate this as tree. And what a beautiful link that here, from the cross of Jesus, the cross of Jesus is what guarantees our ability to be here one day with life forever, eating from the tree of life that produces abundantly the number 12 there, 12 kinds of fruit every month. This just draws my mind right back to all of the blessings that we have if we trust in Jesus. I mean, just to list some for you. Chosen, you are made holy, blameless, righteous, forgiven, unconditionally loved, predestined, adopted, accepted in the beloved. That's just from Ephesians 1. Redeemed, freed from slavery, washed clean in your conscience, having the eternal inheritance, being sealed and marked, being partakers of the divine nature into Peter chapter 1, one in Christ, being one body, being a new humanity, and so on. All of these, I look at the tree of life and I look at the cross of Christ that enables me to eat from the tree of life forever. And for you and I to know, nothing can threaten that. Heavenly existence with the Lord Jesus. Under the curse, no one could enter the garden, but in the new heavens and new earth, the water of life and the tree of life are continually available because of Jesus, who gives water and fruit of his cross. And that's just the curse undone in God's place, a picture of God's place being renewed, but here a picture of God's people. You know, one of the commentators pointed out, which I thought was quite cool, the fact that in this life, because you and I are, in the grander scheme of things sometimes, fairly insignificant, and we are not going to have our faces on a TV show. We are not going to perhaps darken the doors of Windsor or, you know, any sort of royal palace anywhere. We'll never be maybe face to face with even the people whose books we admire because we're just sort of down here, aren't we? I mean, you might be thinking, speak for yourself. But overall, I just don't think I'm ever going to see anybody of supremely great importance face to face. And yet, I comfort myself with this great thought that here is what's going to happen to God's people. 
from being unable to enter the garden where God walks in Genesis to verse 4. They will see his face. To see. Yes, this is beautiful picture language, but it conveys a sense of a deeper knowledge and quality of relationship with God that we can even dream of right now. Moses couldn't see his face and live. In the new garden, those of us who now are being transformed, and like the Beatitudes say, desire purity eagerly, one day will have as our reward to see him. I mean, look at this for a minute. Would you, by looking at the bottom pictures, be able to tell easily what that person is feeling? I mean, would you be able to tell that the first is anger and the third is fear? Easily? I think not. (laughs) I think if we swapped that for a Japanese theater mask that covers the whole face, you would know nothing about that person, would you? And yet, how amazingly, when that mask drops... The amount of knowledge just a few facial muscles gives you of a person. How different it is uh, for you to just to hear from someone, I love you, than for you to look at their face and on their face see compassion, see a desire uh, for closeness. Sometimes just looking at someone's face, you can see uh, how sorry they are, how joyful they are. Without any words, to think that there is a time coming when I'm going to see God face to face, when I'm going to have such a deep and intimate knowledge of the Lord, that on His face I will see the love of a Father who longs to be with His children in a way I haven't seen before. That in the face of Jesus I will see the love of a family member, because Hebrews chapter 2 says He's not ashamed to call us brothers. That's pretty amazing. That makes me long for it. And yet it also says that his people are transformed not only to be able to see his face, but to belong to him. His name, verse 4, will be on their foreheads. Do you know why people do dares? Have you ever done a dare? My wife at university had a dare with her, fr- uh, uh, with her friends that whenever they did something, I can't remember what it was they did, they had to lie down on the floor, face down. That was the dare. And one of her friends uh, tried this in a public toilet. And she did lay face down. I understand. She did do it? She didn't do it. Okay, fine. She was normal. She was normal. I found some dares from licking something disgusting to smearing dog poop on someone's face to covering oneself in peanut butter. But from these silly dares to the world of initiation rites, whether it's at a university or at a secret society, we human beings do some crazy things to belong, to feel like we belong to a group, to feel like we've earned our place. This is the most beautiful picture of belonging. Just like we said last week that the high priest had on his head holy to the Lord, here we have on our foreheads, you are His. You belong to Him. His name. No more desire to look for a sense of belonging because there's never a question, a doubt. You are fully His. Just like you were meant to. In the new garden, we Christians who know we are now in exile, longing for our true home, will finally be there. That's why somebody can say in, for example, C.S. Lewis is the last battle. They can say this when they enter uh, the presence of God in heaven. Someone says, I have come at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up. Come further in. Do you long to be there? Do you long to be in the presence of God in this way? So this is the curse undone in God's place and in God's people. Let's briefly talk about the message confirmed. 
Now, would it entice you if I said this product over here is endorsed by Zendaya? Would that perhaps make you want to, if there's a, pick a celebrity of your choice perhaps, you know, look, it's beautiful fragrance. Does that entice you more? No, none of our teenagers are persuaded by this. What about this? Perhaps now that you see Ed Sheeran recommending to you Heinz ketchup, you want it more, don't you? Do you think there's any connection between Ed Sheeran and a bottle of ketchup that perhaps lends credibility to it? <laughs> um, well, you can, I suppose you could say all sorts of things that you might regret. But what I think is amazing is we come to the very end of the book of Revelation. And, do you know, if there was here somebody like, I don't know, Mary Berry, Greg Wallace, Fred Siries, okay, maybe if you know, so Gordon Ramsay even. Behind that, I would go, ooh, new formula, okay, new recipe, maybe I'll give that a go. There's a bit of credibility there. They know what they're talking about, isn't it? And how amazing that at the end of the book of Revelation, we have a big shout for where the credibility is in this message. Revelation ends with brush strokes on the people standing behind the message, people who bring credibility to the words, and we are challenged to see these words as words to be kept, words to be preserved, and witnesses to be believed. So you remember that as we think about that first words to be kept, do you remember how the book of Revelation started us off? Blessed is anybody who hears and takes to heart what's written in this prophecy. In chapter 22, verse 7, what do we find there? I'm coming soon, the Lord Jesus says. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. How do we do that? You've heard the book of Revelation be preached. I hope you'll have been encouraged. How do we take it to heart? Let me tell you a few things. We yearn for Jesus' return. We long for it. Can you see that? Look, verse 7, I'm coming. Verse 12, I'm coming. Verse 20, I'm coming. For us to yearn and we respond as the church in verse 17 and in verse 20. Come back. Come back, Lord Jesus. We can see the brokenness of this world. We are frustrated with our own sinful hearts. Come back. We want to be with you. We call him Lord Jesus because we want to obey it. Obey Him. We long for it so that we want to see a moment, a time when our bodies are transformed and we finally get to live as we were meant to. If we don't love and long for that now, heaven doesn't make any sense for us at all. If we hunger and thirst for righteousness now, it would make sense that we'll be filled in the eternal state with God. So we yearn for his return, and we therefore try to be ready for his return. We have a desire to obey. We have a desire to hold our material blessings loosely, so that if God gives or takes away, we bless his name. We are, our readiness is seen in how much we want to share the gospel. We desire to tell other people. I mean, look at verse 17. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wants it Take the water of life free of charge. Isn't that the reason you and I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people? Isn't that the reason why you long and pray for, uh, say, you know, the Harper Joneses as they go, for the people in your workplace, for neighbors, for friends? This is the reason, isn't it? Because we want them first to see they are thirsty. They are thirsty. They're trying to quench their thirst in all sorts of other things and idolatries. And they'll be frustrated. And we want to show them they'll be frustrated. So that we can bring them to the water of life. And we do all of this with the tone that the book of Revelation ends. What's the last verse? What's the tone that's there? The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. 
just as God has started the scriptures in the book of Genesis with a grace that dresses Adam and Eve after their sin, a grace that continues to reveal himself, here he says, you rely on this same grace and strength that I give so that you won't give up. And yet there's a warning. A warning for me as someone who teaches the scriptures. A warning for you. Some of it's there in verse 18. These are words to be kept, to be obeyed, but words to be preserved. I'm going to have the danger to add to them in the book of Revelation and throughout the rest of the Bible. I'm going to have the danger, perhaps as a church leader, to place burdens on other people that are simply not easily seen here. You're going to have dangers to add burdens on yourself that are not in the book of Revelation. Whether that's to prove yourself before God or to add to the gospel. And in verse 19, you have dangers of taking it away, of taking words away, of skipping, even in the book of Revelation, difficult parts that our culture is not happy for you to talk about. Just as I understand in this morning's sermon, do we want to talk about the judgment of God? How many chapters didn't we spend talking about how although the Lord judges the earth, people still don't repent, and yet, whether it's George doing an open air or me teaching children and young people in a school, I must and you must speak of the judgment of God on our sin. But we want to take away from it. We want to skip it. To act, I would so far as to say, I would go so far as to say, to act in any other way than taking the book of Revelation and the rest of Scripture, to act in any other way than to say, I believe it, is to change it. To change the urgency of the words. To change that the Lord is saying, this is here for you to believe it. And lastly, there are witnesses to be believed. In verse 8, we have John saying, I, John, am the one who heard. I saw these things. John is the witness. He's not hallucinating this. Uh, you know that because a hallucination doesn't yield the beautiful literary poetry that r brings us right back to the Old Testament and shows us the fulfillment of all of those hopes as we've been traveling through the book of Revelation. Uh, John isn't on acid. Uh, this stuff is real and true and beautiful. It also doesn't benefit him, does it? There were no Jews that expected um, uh, the end times to be like this. There were no Jews that expected uh, for God to divide the world not into Jews and non-Jews, but into believers and unbelievers. And John is just concerned with telling us, this stuff is true, you must believe it. So much so that when I fall into idolatry and I, John, need to be told off and rebuked, I'm going to put that in there because I want you to know this is true. I'm going to make myself look bad because I, want, I'm, I care about the truth. And the second witness to be believed is the Lord Jesus Christ, who speaks in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give to you the testimony for the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. And who speaks again in verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am, I am coming soon. The Lord Jesus has shown every promise that he has made he has kept. We have every reason to yearn for his return, knowing he will do this. And so we look at the curse undone, we long for it. We look at a, a place renewed, water of life, tree of life, life forever with him, looking at his face, a quality of relationship that we don't have now. We look at the message being confirmed the challenge that we ought to keep these words looking at this life just as it is a prelude to an existence with him forever. Words preserved, resisting every temptation to bow to the culture when it says, don't talk about judgment. Don't upset people. And we see here that all of our faith is grounded in witnesses that are inspired by the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus himself.
let's long for this day. I could talk about it, you can talk about it. But our challenge is, as I studied this, I pray, I prayed. Do that, pray and ask the Lord Jesus, give me a longing for this and then worship him. Worship him in song. Worship him in prayer. And see him give you a longing for this existence before the face of God one day. Let's pray now. Lord Jesus, we can, we can read this and not have our hearts stirred. We can read this and not long or yearn for it. But we pray that you would help us. That every frustration in this life, every disappointment would bring us right back to the fact that we are going to have this existence with you. With bodies glorified and transformed. With no more night or darkness of sin. Beholding your face in a way that no Old Testament or New Testament person has been able to see. Give us truly a longing and a desire that eclipses our idolatrous desires, that eclipses our disordered desires that want to bring us away from you. Help us to delight in you above all things now as a sample of what we will have with you forever as your people. Thank you for this hope. Thank you that not even the devil who prowls around can devour it out of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen.